Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the build of my recent Sapili wardrobe job. That's coming up next. So yes, this has been a big job and it's occupied a lot of my time over the last sort of few weeks. Uh, it's occupied a few previous videos as well. Uh, if you saw my finger pulls with Overlow Scribe, well, that covered the doors of these wardrobes. Uh, and the first job on the Zeta, the video that came out last week, uh, was all about using the Zeta on this particular job uh, and how I use that machine to to cut the mortises and uh, all the slots uh, and everything else. Uh, I'm not going to go into the gory detail about this whole job because, to be honest, apart from the fact that it was veneered Sapili, uh, it was pretty much like every other wardrobe job that I've ever done, and I've done a few of those in the past. If you want a more recent refresher, then uh, the big wardrobe videos 253 and 254 cover very similar ground, and if you want to go back a little way, then a uh, seven part series, uh, what was it, wardrobes, panel doors and top boxes starting at video 037 covers that in a, in a lot of detail. Again, you know, all the, all the clever tricks about hiding screws behind hinge plates and all that sort of stuff, they're all covered in that series. What I did want to get into in this series though is, is how the job came about and why it is how it is. It's interesting because although it's three double wardrobes and top boxes, no two are the same. It's sort of a, an asymmetric uh, set of wardrobes to fit into a particular room. Let me run you through the plans for this and I'll show you what I mean. Alrighty, well this was a wide room with an asymmetric alcove because the room had been nibbled away on the right hand side uh, to put a bathroom in as many Victorian houses have. It's actually a really nice refurb with a full re-detailed plaster, original plaster uh, cornice coving that's been restructured. Uh, so part of the job was absolutely not to touch that cornice. So anyway, uh, the, the alcove itself uh, was was asymmetrical. It was it was much wider on the left hand side, almost twelve hundred wide, than it was on the right, uh, where it was only about four four ten four twenty something like that, and a big wide chimney breast in the centre. Um, I'll just pause to say that the beauty of bespoke furniture here is that you can work around this. Uh, and what the clients actually decided to do was to have a deep wardrobe. Uh, on the left hand side going all the way into the alcove and they were going to put shelves in the back of that and hanging rails in the front. These, This is for a spare bedroom so it's not going to be used every day so there'll be stuff on the shelves for longer term storage and hanging space for you know when people are staying. Uh, so we had that on the left hand side in the centre where it goes against the chimney breast where it's narrower not as deep. Uh, you can have a regular sized regular depth wardrobe and on the right hand side, well this is where it gets interesting, again the beauty of bespoke, you can actually go, we've gone into the alcove, so you've got a sort of a, a, a dog's leg uh, sort of wardrobe here, uh, where the, the little bit in the alcove again provides some storage and then hanging space in the front of this. Uh, and then above the wardrobe carcasses there are top boxes that go up to just beneath the plaster coving and obviously they reflect the same sort of floor plan as the base cabinets beneath them. Uh, the plaster cornice uh, wasn't uh, affected at all, we had to stay well clear of that so there's actually a big infill above the, uh, above the top boxes to the ceiling and that had to be scribed into the ceiling and we'll get into all that uh, later on. So everything was cut and edge banded for me by the timber yard. This happened whilst I was away on holiday so I had to get the uh, very elaborate um, cut lists organised. The cut lists alone took uh, about a day to do. Uh, as I say, they are extremely elaborate. Because of uh, the veneered finish, I had to be specific about which grain direction I wanted, because I wanted it to, to look right. Uh, and basically there were three cut lists, each reflecting each sort of wardrobe and top box stack. I opted for the right hand wardrobe with the sort of cutaway, the dog's leg in, I just had that made as a as a plain full size piece for the top and bottom and then I opted to cut those uh, bases and tops out myself here in the workshop because that's kind of my job, uh, not theirs. Anyway, the uh, Tibby did a great job for me and when I came back from holiday I had a whole raft of material <laughs> 
<laughs> to collect. It took me two two journeys in the van to bring it all back here. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, uh, once it was all back here, I had to sort of mark everything up. Uh, because it's veneered, I've had to put little bits of tape, masking tape and Sharpie on everything because you can't just sort of scribble on the on the board and then paint it over. Uh, so it was all very carefully marked uh, and identified uh, and then I started out by cutting the shelf pin holes in the left and right torque arcuses, there's no shelf in the centre, uh, and then in all the top boxes as each top box also has an adjustable shelf. Uh, and then it was onto the cutting the slots for the regular carcasses. And again, there's nothing special here. I'm using four fittings in the deeper carcass and two in the shallower one. Uh, and as I said in the previous video, I hadn't actually decided at this, this point what fittings I was actually going to use. Probably Clamex in the front and rear fittings and Tensos in the centres. In fact, I probably could have used Biscos if I'd have had any in time, uh, but that's what I used in, in the final event and they worked extremely well. Uh, I want to talk a, a little bit about the corner fitting because this was <laughs> quite complex to put together. Uh, and I'll be doing a separate video about that uh, along the lines of constructional design uh, for this particular piece. I've mentioned constructional design before and by that I mean the, the process of designing how things are put together because the order in which they go together when you're using any kind of mortise and tenon type fitting, whether they're dowels, whether they're dominoes, whether they're tensos or clamex, it does actually affect you know which bits can go where. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that in a separate video but uh, I, I did actually make a mistake on this one and I had to resort to a few screws to finish it off. So I mentioned earlier that I didn't want the timber yard to have the responsibility of making that sort of dog's leg cut out in the right hand side base cabinet so I did that myself uh, and this involved a lot of you know, very careful intricate calculations because you know, there's a lot of work involved in in producing all these uh, dimensions and figuring out how it actually all has to go together and as I say I'll touch on that in, a, in another video, video when I talk about how exactly these things need to be constructed but what I found I had to do was uh, I used the actual work pieces the actual sides and backs and things to measure off on the base and then make that cut out and then I literally just taped it together dry assembled it before we get into doing uh, domino mortises or, or lamello slots or, or whatever they are. I just literally sticky taped it together to give me an idea of how it was all gonna gonna work. Uh, one of the things I did actually have to do was use tape on the board to mark the slot positions. I could use my usual sort of little hinge plate as a saddle square, mark those hinge positions up, then run a blade down between the tape between the two boards and the tape stayed in place and still had my mark on it so I could get the mark where I needed it to, even though there was no common point of reference on the two boards, uh, just to mark those those uh, fitting positions in place. So with the dry fit complete on the base, I can use that base as a template and cut the other tops and bases, then press on with cutting the slots. After that, it was a dry fit with the top box just to make sure that it all went together okay. Uh, often, if you have a top box and carcass that have a common footprint, it's a really good idea just to dry fit the top box, then that throws up any issues that you may have because obviously the top box and carcass below uh, have a similar footprint or should have an identical footprint, in which case you can spot any problems with the small carcass before <laughs> moving on to oiking the big one about. Uh, after that then it was on to marking out the hinge positions. I'm using a rod or story stick to mark these out and make sure they stay consistent. And then it was sanding and waxing. I sanded back to P180 before the first coat and then again to P320 for the second. I'm using Osmo clear satin finish applied with a stockinette cloth and it really brings the grain up beautifully in the Sapelia veneer. Now 
Now the shells were being lipped with a solid sapili edging and the sapili took a little while to arrive. In fact, I couldn't order it from my normal supply. I had to order it from somewhere else. Uh, and it didn't arrive until I was actually out on the install. Uh, so I had a couple of evenings where I was doing like a day's install and then coming back to do a few hours here in the workshop. In fact, it was my first lamello, not failure exactly, but disappointment, let's say. I shot a little bit of sort of vlog style video at the time. So let's have a quick look at that now. So it's, uh, yeah, 25 past seven in the evening after a long old day. And I've just finished a three hour domino uh, and clamping session on some shelves, uh, 14 shelves in total, quite a lot. Uh, more of those down there. Yes, still painted tables behind me. Uh, don't ask. Uh, so uh, first sort of, not failure, but first sort of disappointment really with the lamella, with the Zeta. Uh, the tensor connectors just weren't uh, strong enough to pull. I'm, I'm putting hardwood lipping onto uh, the veneered shelves for this big wardrobe job that I'm involved in at the minute. And I was in here at seven this morning getting some stuff prepared uh, for the day. Uh, I've gone out and I've done that day's work. I was back here for about four so I've just put in another, you know, three and a half hour shift. Let's say again, I've half past seven in the evening now. Uh, and what I thought would be just a quick hour or so with the lamello and the tensos, you know, boof, boof. The tensos apply 15 kilos of pressure and clamp everything up nice and tight. In reality, it's nowhere near enough, or it has not been anywhere near enough to clamp this particular uh, Sapili edging onto the veneered Sapili boards. So I had to go back to clamping them. And if I'm going to clamp them, I'm obviously I might as well use the uh, domino, just regular dominoes, because they're pennies each rather than the tensors, which are you know, 60, 70 pence a piece. Uh, you know, I, I would have happily spent them, spent that money if they'd have done the job, you know, four in each of these long shells, but just not, uh, just not doing it. So. A little bit uh, about that at the minute. Uh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I start putting the carcasses together with the uh, uh, with the tensors and the clamex tomorrow. So we'll see what happens with those. Uh, I'll take a box of screws with me just in case. But anyway, uh, more to come on this. But that's uh, the first little sort of disappointment for, uh, with the system. Uh, yeah. So yes, just to be clear, uh, on the longer lengths, these are over a metre wide, this is not the shelves, which is why we're having a solid Sapili edge. Uh, the, the, the Sapili was just ever so slightly twisted, slightly bowed, and the tensor fittings just didn't seem to have enough sort of oomph to pull that edge in. Uh, I could have used the tensors and clamped it as well, but um, if I'm going to have to clamp it, then I opted to use the much cheaper dominoes. It's something that I do need to look at in a bit more detail to see if it's an issue I can recreate but in the middle of a job, I just needed to get it done and get a coat of finish on the shelves so you fall back to what you know works. And in my instance, in my case, it was very much dominoes and clamps. But apart from that little niggle, uh, it all went together very well. That was kind of it for the build, really. No great dramas or crises. It all really went pretty much to plan. I will have another video out later on where I'm going to talk you through the actual install. I didn't shoot much in terms of video on the install because it's work and there just isn't time but I've got some still pictures so I'll, uh, and a little bit of video about a couple of bits and pieces so I'll talk you through that uh, in another video uh, but that's it for this video if you're interested in how the costings for something like this work out on a job like this then you might want to head over and join the Patreon party as I'll have a video out uh, probably over the weekend for my Patreon supporters about what this job actually costs to put together. There are links down in the video description about how you can sign up to support the channel through Patreon or through direct donation, as well as links to lots of handy little bits and pieces used or featured in this video. But that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.